appreciate your all being here today, especially as mental health professionals, your interest <coughs> on this topic. As you know, um, neither pornography or social media is going away, mm -hmm. and it's having a huge impact, not on adults, but also on our kids. And um, that impact leads to isolation, depression, and just really poor family dynamics. So Kendra and I, feeling really passionate about this growing need, have put together Families Plugged In. And what that is is what we want to not just address the impact um, of porn and social media on kids, but also address what we can begin to do about it um, and how to really help and start the conversation with educators and with parents on directly addressing what do we do? We're going to be on our phones. Kids are going to be on their phones. And how do we go in there and not avoid or become afraid of those conversations? And we feel that that's really important. There's so much, and, and I think as a society we know that's important, but there's so much out there today about unplugging which is <laughs> awesome and great and taking hikes, but we also need to address the reality that our kids are going to be on their phones and they're going to see things that we don't want them to see. So Yeah, yeah, happy to be here. Um, a little background about why we came together to build this talk and this program was we were both um, in private practice, still are, but I was seeing kids and teens and Daniela was working with families and individuals we kept talking about how it seems more than ever there's a disconnect between parents and kids. They're just not having the conversations that need to be had. <coughs> and so of course technology, we're not anti-technology, like it's a good thing and it can be used for connection, but it's a huge obstacle for a lot of families preventing parents and kids connecting um, in ways that are really important for development. So our whole goal is to put um, tools back in the hands of parents to um, make it easier to connect and not struggle so much with it. All right. So to get us started, a little activity. I'm curious if anyone notices the images or apps up here. And you can just Recognize shout it, it out yes. and no let us know. All right, yeah, this one's pretty known. Mm -hmm. Anything else? That might be Good. Sims, okay. yeah. Um, but it's called a sex mod. Does anyone know what that is no. in video games? Okay. So we'll get more into it, but it's a way that the porn industry is marketing to kids. Um, as we were doing some research, we, it was shocking how um, they market to kids in subtle ways, and there's a lot going on in videos and gaming. Um, what about, about the calculator? Yeah, we're going the same one. way. <laughs> So there's thousands of apps um, for kids to um, store private photos that look like regular apps that parents would not catch. So this is the most popular one. It's just a secret photo vault. And the thread of all of these, we can go through them, but it doesn't even matter because tomorrow they're gone and there's <laughs> a thousand more that are coming up, but that they're all anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, it is for predators, for people to go on and um, really try to engage with young, young kids. And in the field of body image and um, bullying, Burn Book and Whisper are two really, really popular ones with preteens and teens. Um, and they're both anonymous, but Whisper, you can just go on and um, share secrets with strangers. This one's more related to the school you're at, so it's an anonymous posting app, and you're linked to the school. So a lot of bullying and social comparison. And how, I'm curious about the school officials. Do they say, oh, well, I, we can't deal with that because that happens off campus? You know, with, because you said it's yeah. linked to schools school community? Yeah, that's something where it's a great question. Something um, 
we're going to touch on a little. More and okay. more schools are wanting Kendra and I to come and give these talks and really address them. I think what you're saying more specifically is how is it dealt with with schools, with kids going on? Yeah. And, and I think we are still in the <coughs> era of uh, blind eye uh -huh. and, yeah, unless it's specifically brought up. Okay. And with that being said, there's a lot of politics that go into the drama of posting um, and school. I think schools are facing a lot of challenges with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So the reason we're showing you this um, is to give you a taste, or maybe you're a parent, um, of what parents are facing. We hear a lot that they're overwhelmed. They feel anxious about what's out there. Um, we often hear that they can never get ahead of what's going on. And someone mentioned it feels like they're a foreigner. And that causes a lot of anxiety. Um, and so we're here to just kind of set the table and show you what's happening and what parents are facing and feeling. And unfortunately, when parents feel anxiety, what does anxiety do? It kills connection and presence. And so it's kind of part of the, part of the issue. All right, so um, I'll share. This statistic blew my mind when I first learned it. And there's a few, there's a little bit of controversy about the specific number of the global profit of porn. But we found from one source that it was 90 billion. So that, that blew my mind. And to put it into perspective, the NFL makes 8.1 and Hollywood's around 10. Um, of course, these two are more in the U.S., but 90 billion annually around the globe. Really big business, and what we're finding is <coughs> it's more and more large companies, that there are companies behind the companies that are running this. Mm -hmm. So, um, wow. yeah, that's how prevalent. We used to have yeah. the idea that it's um, the isolated male, you know, lurking in the, you know, sure, that's some of it, but really the bigger issue is this. Yeah. And, and that's why it's not going away. Yeah. And that's just why we feel so passionate about talking about this, because our kids are involved. But we're here to reduce the fear and anxiety around it. Um, and then I'm sure this one isn't too shocking, but the average age of first exposure is 11. I've heard a lot younger. Of course, that's an average. It's, um, <coughs> yeah, that's just happening. So, um, not surprising, the porn industry markets directly to our kids, despite whatever we may believe in terms of laws or not. 97% uh, of boys, 80% 80 80 of girls under the age of 18 have viewed porn. Of those, 23% of boys said they tried to stop watching but could not. 8% of girls tried to stop watching but could not. Now, what's significant here, um, besides the prevalence, is that, look, porn objectification have always been around, right, through time. But, you know, back in the day, it was magazines or maybe hidden magazines under the bed. Mm -hmm. Now, because those images are getting, like, multi-images in a split second, it's actually changing the structure of our kids' brains. And that's, and the science isn't fully out yet, but what we do know is that we are seeing um, young men with addiction, with porn addiction, young boys with porn addiction who are terrified to go to anybody about it. They feel that they can't stop doing it. Um, the men cannot get erections with a <coughs> partner leave alone, um, have any type of intimacy or sexual experience. And of course there's devastating repercussions around that. But we're really, we're seeing a tremendous problem in already the ramifications of that. Um, I don't know if any of you saw, Lisa Ling did a really good program on CNN mm -hmm. um, that addressed some of it. And one of the things at the end, she interviewed um, high school kids of what they would have wanted. And the majority of them said, well, we get some education at school, and I'm not even sure if that's really so much the case. And then we hear the rest from our friends or what we see from social media or even porn. And if we knew, if we had more information of what that really does to us 
and how that affects our relationships. And that would have been really important. We wish we would have known that. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, you said that so many people, boys would have trouble having an erection because they watch so much porn. They why? actually can't get why? an erection with someone else because they are masturbating uh -huh. to the pornography. Mm -hmm. And in that, and that goes back to their minds <coughs> changing, uh -huh that they can't, they find that they can't, there's not enough stimulation, that it's not enough, it, it's not fast enough with being okay. with a real life person, which is really more intimacy. Okay, I thought so, but thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, one of the people I work with, he has problems with his girlfriend because she doesn't rate up with the quality of the actresses in the porn. Mm -hmm. Right, Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can't, and that, you know, we'll get into that, but really how do we begin to teach young people who are looking at that, that that's also fake, <laughs> but we will get more into that, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah, tons of false realities out there, from yeah. porn to social media. So before we dive more into techniques and tips and tools that um, we can help our parents that we work with, or maybe your own families, um, it's important to just, again, state the reality of what's going on. So the truth is, as we all know, technology is evolving literally every second, every minute of every day, and it's not going to go anywhere. And so, again, our goal um, was to really come together to give parents tools while the family's plugged in, while the phones are out, while they're on the laptops doing um, schoolwork. And it's truly not about um, getting ahead of what kids are seeing. It's about letting go. And I think this doesn't always land well with parents because how in the world <coughs> can you let go? There's so much out there. Um, but again, that's linked to parental anxiety dropping, and that's when the connection happens. So teens now spend an average of 7 hours, 22 minutes per day on screens. Um, and that's not including their homework and schoolwork. So here for Kendra and I, what's really important is connection over controls. And by controls, it's really twofold. One, um, and there are a lot of people out there who teach this, and it, it has its place, but parental controls really don't work. And <coughs> in some worlds, that's a little bit controversial, my saying that. But <laughs> they don't work because if kids really want to get in, especially once they start getting into middle school, high school, they will go for it no matter what. They can get burner phones very easily. They can, they go to a friend's house and it's there. Um, so trying to control is just giving most kids another reason to rebel and buck and not really what we want to reinforce is joining with kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, the second part of the control is you're just creating for a parent. There's just creating a system for that teen or tween to rebel against. Um, it's really important. We want to work with parents to start early, start talking. There's so many ways to join in. Um, it's when kids, especially like, you know, those, the consoles and the video games and that type of thing of, hey, I don't think it's my thing, but what are you doing there? Maybe can I try around with you? Can I, you know, show me how, how you play? And then even if you're not into it, to be able to say, um, you know, I can see, like, where this gets really addictive. I just want to play the next game and get better. Um, you might, as a parent, they might actually find that feeling happening anyway. Um, I hear a lot of moms <coughs> complaining about dads who are as bad or worse than the kids when they get into it, but joining in understanding or joining in if they see their son or daughter on Instagram and, oh, what are you looking at? What's going on? Really early on and this notion of being collaborative instead of, are you on your phone again? What the hell? What's going on? <laughs> but really being empathic of, Oh, I see on this Instagram photo that your friends are all together. Is that something you were included in? How is that for you to not 
be part of that. So it really begins to be when parents can learn to join in and not just get exasperated, something they can work mm -hmm. together towards. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to talk about. Um, what about like, when the child is playing the video game if the parent says, why don't we maybe read some interesting book or play a board game to try to induce the video? So I, I love that. Parents that are I think <laughs> ideally that's great. But if you're going to do that, what happens? Um, can anyone, a parent says, let's do a board game together in the midi middle of a game. What's going to happen? What's that kid going to say? Resist. Yeah, yeah. Resist. Like, yeah, maybe, what? What'd you say? Maybe later, you know, at best, at best. Um, I think those are great. Those come into about unplugging. But I think you have to be aware of your moment of, hey, why don't I play a game with you? Why don't I join you? And then afterwards, what if we um, do a board game too? And I think that message will be much better heard. Um, what about teens that totally don't want their parents involved with it? They're looking at Instagram or social media and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's more the reality. Oh, and, and that goes back to if you start early, when they first have their phones. But I think um, there are ways, and it's not easy, to really begin to do that of, you know what, instead of, I want to tell you to get off your phone, but instead of telling you to do that, I'm going to join you. You know, wanna, why don't you just show me what's going on? You know, tell me, I want to know more about you. But it's, it's tricky because if there's been a certain cycle in place there for a while, oof, they're not going to want to be like, come look at the picture. But we'll talk later about some techniques about how to kind of before that set yourself up uh -huh, as a right. parent so you can get in. Yeah, and although, you know, it's obviously it's ideal to start earlier, it's never too late to join. Absolutely. You just have to plant seeds um, even when it won't be smooth sailing. <laughs> All right, anything else? I think we're good. All right. So let's take a closer look at um, the direct impact that social media has on sexual development. So does anyone in here not have some form of social media? OK. <laughs> so we all, awesome, wow, one person, good for you. Um, so most of us have an idea of the <coughs> The impact social media has on mental health and well-being in general. I think anyone scrolling through um, any social media platform looking at idealized or perfect scenarios, it totally messes with well-being. And the, the thing that we're seeing with kids, they're on apps way more um, than we are, especially the younger generations. And their brains are literally taking in thousands of images every single day. Um, especially Instagram and TikTok, those are the two. Does anyone have clients who are on TikTok or kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Um, so I was really curious about, okay, what is happening when the brain is exposed to so much input? And the problem is, um, while they're being inundated with all the input, they're learning about um, ways to dress from watching the celebrities, what to say, what to do with girls and boys sexually, um, how to work out. All of this input without conversations and without education and without su um, support from teachers or even older peers or therapists. So it's this huge imbalance um, that's happening and they are learning quickly and so it's so so important to um, help parents create the conversations to help balance out what they're seeing because they're just copying what they're seeing um, and one of the main things that I see in my practice that I have to unfold with a lot of kids and adults also is they're learning from looking at these images in order to be loved, in order to be accepted, or um, in order to be worthy, I have to look like this. I have to dress like this. My body has to look like this. And so that's naturally driving up um, body dysmorphia. That's on one extreme. Um, body anxiety is, is, I think, something we can all <laughs> relate to. I don't think I've ever met someone who's 100% confident in their body. 
Um, but these images are really powerful and causing a huge disconnect um, with feeling unworthy because they don't look a certain way. It's never good enough. Really. Yeah. It, it, it it's aren't, and a lot of the images are photoshopped, right? So they're not even comparing themselves to real Right. That's the right. that's the problem. It's com it's fake. And a lot of my clients show me there's apps where you can literally squeeze in the waist. It's, it takes five seconds mm -hmm. to change the body. So yeah. So um, in terms of what that's doing um, for boys' expectations of what girls want and also what they look like and girls' expectations of what boys want. And this kind of goes back a little bit to, yes, images on social media that are sexually explicit as well, and pornography. But can anyone guess of what boys are learning in regard to what it is to be a man sexually? Being more aggressive towards girls, or like more dominating? Mm -hmm. Can you be more specific? Like <laughs> They objectify women and girls. Yes. It's an object. You don't have any, you're not real. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, and yeah. that's some of it. But really, what? How about no means yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great mm -hmm. point you bring up. Um, and more <laughs> specifically, what they're actually learning from what they see. Oh, I'll get sorry. to you in one second. I'm um, not to touchy. Mm -hmm. Like grabbing. Inappropriate. Things. Right. But they are learning what girls want is to be ejaculated on their faces and strangled. And more and more girls, too, uh, going back to your point, are looking towards violence or feeling there, there's now a trend, too, of, um, and there's a name for it that I won't get into, but oral sex that is particularly violent. Um, and you know, it, it just trends up. So, and there are many girls, what's interesting is who are asking the boys to strangle them while the boys are ejaculating. So it is going both ways. This mm -hmm. expectation and girls kind of wanting, you know, this kind of reverse of they're gonna take it matters in their own hand and ask for the violence. So it is really concerning and disturbing. Um, in the same token, younger kids, if they're being exposed to it in regard to false assumptions and their puberty. So on one hand, it's easy for them to make fun of the girls or talk about things. On the other, they're very uncomfortable with their own um, development and puberty about getting hair, about getting erections and feeling uncomfortable with it and they feel like they have no outlet to talk about it. So there's a lot of shame around that. Um, girls too, as their breasts develop, they have a lot of shame around that, trying to, they don't want a bra, they want a sports bra. And conversely, parents are not always getting it and they think, oh, my daughter, she just started her menstrual cycle and they want to celebrate it and they don't get that their daughters are mortified. Um, so mm -hmm. they're, they're, we see this big disconnect. Yeah, and just to quickly mention, um, socially, kids uh, from elementary through high school, and I'd say even college, the social hierarchy, the social dynamics, it's already so much pressure. I'm sure we can all go back to middle school. <laughs> it's a lot to handle. And so the um, age of onset for anxiety and even body dysmorphia keeps dropping. And I think it's directly related to social media because the images add um, additional pressure again. In order to be accepted, I have to look or behave this certain way. Um, so I'm sure you see a lot of anxious kids in your practices. And here is, this is a very, um, relaxed version of what we could show you of what kids are, are copying. 
Um, but I just wanted to, you know, hit the point that they're truly looking images like this throughout the day, all the time, and copying it. Um, but what's going on, it's completely fake reality. And the pictures that you take, um, <coughs> it's not even your own body. So that disconnect just happens so often, um, but it's so common. And again, the truth is you never arrive. You never get to the right body. Even if you lose the weight or buy the outfit, the, the marker keeps moving. And that's what causes this anxiety. And also, there's always someone in the girl group, girls have competition who can eat the least. And there's always that person, that mm -hmm. one person who's thinner. Um, by the way, the increase in boys having anorexia mm -hmm. is growing as well. Yeah. So. This is a pervasive problem. All right. <clears throat> OK, so before your clients can move through the shame and discomfort of sex talks, they need to first learn how to address their own shame and discomfort around sex and sexuality, specifically when talking to their kids. So they're very comfortable maybe on um, You've gone to like dinner parties or parties and people are joking around of their sex lives, lack thereof, the sex, sexual jokes. But somehow when it comes to their kids, they know that that's not inappropriate and they don't understand what the appropriate language <coughs> is and they don't know, they don't know how to do that. Um, and so what's really important is they first have to understand how do they begin to What's the holdup? And we all have it um, in terms of when we think back on our own times of puberty, confusion, the questions we had, um, maybe the shame around it. And parents, when they come to their kids, they seem to lose track of what, what that was. So it includes what, what kind of belief systems did they grow up with? What was the family culture? Uh, what was the community's culture or maybe religious beliefs. So I had one client who told me she grew up in a fairly happy and healthy childhood. Um, she was Christian and she went to a camp through her church. And she talked about um, one of the activities one day was uh, going and picking flowers. And then she said they were told to place a flower in their hand and look at it, and then scrunch the flower up, and then open their hand. And when they opened their hand, they said, before you closed your hand and scrunched up your flower, that was your virginity. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, look what happened to your virginity, and it can never be fixed again. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of those powerful messages at times we can get. That, that create a lot of shame that can be very scarring. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. yeah, we wanted to um, make this um, interactive. So obviously share as much as you feel comfortable or as little, but I want you to first, before you break off into small groups, think back to your earliest um, understanding um, about sex and puberty, not your experiences. <laughs> Just your understanding, the messages. Yeah, we don't want TMI, but don't, Not don't your give experience. us your first sexual experience. <laughs> but think back to interactions you had with your parents or caregivers or siblings. Like what meaning, what messages did you absorb? What do you wish you had? So break off. You could just turn to someone next to you, three or four um, people in a group. We'll just take a few minutes on this, and then we'll come back together. <laughs> Okay, clearly this is a topic we could all keep talking about for a long time because um, there's not anyone with a pulse where this doesn't hit home for. Um, is there any, um, I guess, big themes from your group that anyone kind of wants to share, um, both in what their experience was or how they would want it differently? Does anyone? Well, yeah, I ahead. think a theme that emerged for us was just that it wasn't to be talked about, even if it was present in the world at the, at the moment, but present in the world of adults, there was no line of communication for the individual 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else want to share? No, everyone wants to keep. Anyone want to share what they would have wished could have happened or how it could have looked differently? I think yeah. in school, if, if like the school I'm working at now, they have flash classes where the girls and boys meet together and they talk about sex related topics. I had that in school. I think we had like one health class and learned about yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that right. Lang, that last, that, that's what the kids were doing. I think they had mm -hmm. mixed groups in that mm -hmm. case. I, I would agree with that. I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. More in the schools. Yeah. 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 Or even outside the school. Some place for the kids to talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But probably a supervised. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that could be good. So um, let's dive into some tools now, but related to what um, some of you shared, I think a big one for parents that I hear is they're so hesitant to talk about anything because they don't <coughs> want to expose their kid to something too soon or that they haven't heard yet. Um, that's a big theme that we see in our practices. but. The truth is, like, kids are exposed to stuff like never before, and what they don't learn from parents or trusted caregivers, they 100% are learning, um, if not from Google. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, ne it's never too early. I mean, obviously, discretion needs to be used, but it's really important, I think, even for earlier kids to just talk about it. And you have a good story coming up related to that. So number one. Um, remembering kids at all ages are sponges. They see and will remember everything and fill in the blanks of what they don't understand incorrectly or in more damaging ways. And it's just really important to remember that kids are meaning-making machines. Constantly they're filling in the narrative or the story of things that don't quite make sense or that feel weird or that feel good. And it's so important for parents to step in and provide like language to what, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. Um, and I'm two. So, two, if you see something explicit or inappropriate with your when you're with your kids um, or something is said, don't ignore or act like it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Because most parents tend to, like, well, they were on their phone, they were looking good, they didn't really see it. Mm -hmm. If you saw it or heard it, you can be sure they heard it loud and clear and they know it's uncomfortable. Um, making a comment actually takes the shame or discomfort out. And um, the story I was telling Kendra the other day, I have a 13-year-old son. And years ago, we were in Paris and we went to the Eiffel Tower. He was about seven or eight. And after walking around, we went in the souvenir sh store. Of course, <laughs> he wanted a little Eiffel Tower to take home. And as he's um, at the front, there's a basket. Um, and he puts his hand in, and he takes one, and he says, oh, mom, these are um, like long balloons with the <laughs> Eiffel Tower on it. And you can guess what it was. Um, and so the French guy behind the counter kind of like smirked and was uncomfortable, and then the Americans in line were kind of giggling and didn't know what to do. And my son knows something has happened, right? He automatically, I can see the shame in his body. He doesn't know why. And it's it just a moment. He's they were condoms for anyone. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I just assumed by everyone's <laughs> laughter that they know. Thank yes. you. Um, and so I said, Alex, those are condoms. Um, they're an adult thing. They're not a balloon. And so he paid for the Eiffel Tower. And then we, as we left, you know, and I could still see, it was just really disheartening and uncomfortable to him. I said, y have you heard that word condoms? And he was young and we just started, we were walking through the Eiffel Tower mm -hmm. and talking about it. My husband said, I guess we're gonna have this conversation right now, right <laughs> here. And sure enough, we did. Um, and it was a lot of explanation because he was very, very young, and including talking about and taking that opportunity to talk about sexuality because at a very young age, parents, to be safe, they talk about it in terms of procreation, right? Um, sex is to have kids. 
but to really talk about it, clearly, <laughs> condoms are not about having kids, but in terms of when people love each other. And it's a way that they come together and feel good, and their bodies feel good. So, mm -hmm. and, and really giving him that healthy context. <coughs> so, um, there are always opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And Daniela's story um, is, is a perfect way, again, to put words, to put a story to an experience that has so many emotions for <coughs> kids. And so when, um, so number three, understand you can't undo anything your child has seen, heard, or experienced. And again, um, just the importance of story. And when you, when you put a story to it, when you talk about what's happening, not only do you normalize the experience, like, ooh, that felt, you know, yucky when they were laughing at me or shameful. Right. Like, like I, I saw that. Um, but you also normalize their feelings, and that's actually really important for body image because mm -hmm. body image goes beyond just how you feel about your physical body. It's much deeper. It, it's also a relationship built into how you feel internally. Like our bodies are amazing and there's so much going on. And so when parents learn to just normalize, hey, I saw that, hey, it looks like you're interested in that, you're just normalizing, hey, your body works, um, it's okay, what you're feeling is normal. I've felt that too, if you feel comfortable enough um, going that far. It's such an important part of helping kids uh, build trust and love for their bodies. What's also important is to remember your perception is different from your kids and what you see is disrespectful, inappropriate, over-sexualized, they perceive as cool and empowering. And so an example of that is uh, if you have a client who said, oh, I had a terrible morning. You should have seen what my, the outfit my daughter came out down in, down the steps in. She was, she's only 12. It like her skirt was so short and it like came up to her top and you know and I told her go change you look like a hooker so now what's happened what's happened with <coughs> the interaction between that parent and child yeah shut down did, did she think she looked mm. horrible and like a hooker no she felt like oh I'm cool I'm going to school like this or mm -hmm. I'm going out with my friends like this and what is important is maybe to change that narrative, to join in with that child and to say, you know what, I see that you're really proud of your body or you feel good about how you look. And that's so important to me. But I wonder for, since you're going to the mall with your friends, for the people who don't know you, if they're really seeing and taking in your smile and how great that is or that they get that you're an amazing piano player or you're great at soccer. And when it is those words that join in, it's so much more empowering, both for the parent, the parent connection, and for the child. Now, they may say of like, <laughs> you know what, I like this outfit anyway, I don't care. But you're beginning to plant seeds of empowerment mm -hmm. and strength rather than this is who you are. If you dress like this, you're down here. Yeah. And that's what's really important. All right. So number five, don't give your input before you ask them what they think and how it makes them feel. First, ask them to help you understand how they feel. So I think this tip is so important for everyone, even partners in a relationship, siblings, um, but especially the parent-child relationship. Uh, because when parents have the ability to have the awareness of a big reaction and pause and breathe and not dismiss their feeling or reaction, they allow a safe space for the conversation to happen. And it's huge. It's so, so important to establish safety in that communication. Um, I was working with a teen um, girl around 14 and she was working through some bullying issues and anxiety and she did not want her parents to join but eventually we got to a place where she was ready. Uh, we had a few sessions just preparing for it because the parents were great and well intentioned but the communication was just a nightmare. So eventually parents came in 
She gathered up the courage to talk about this bullying story that was so hard for her, and she talked about how she called a peer a slut. And right away, Dad said, we don't use that word. And oh Mom God. said, why would you call your best friend a slut? Oh, no. It's okay. <laughs> We're good. Um, and right away, you could feel her energy completely drop. She was closed down, and I knew from then on, like, this, this, we were not going to win anything or get anywhere. And the parents had great intentions. Like, it's okay to want to teach, um, you know, your kids' values and have high morals. But the lesson is second. The connection and the yeah. joining yeah. is first. Yeah. So then I worked with the parents on, hey, you had a really big reaction to when she said this word. That's fine, like have a reaction. But have first there'll be awareness to catch the big feeling, um, table it, and I'm wondering what would have happened if they said after she shared the story, like, hey, I've never heard you use that word before. Like I'm curious what made you call her that. Or mom saying, Where did you even learn the word slut? Like I'm curious. It would have completely shifted the dynamic. So those subtle changes, they can feel so foreign parents but they're so important and how old was uh, the girl 14 mm -hmm. yeah Just so question. to me that story also shows there there's a disconnect of parents if um, that they're saying that they wouldn't think that their 14 year old would a know that word or right. say that word <laughs> right like, it's like okay, what, 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 <laughs> exactly yeah um, the next one what about words sexually, that are sexually explicit. Um, when it comes up, ask them if they know what it means. Most primary and middle school age kids hear and use those words without actually knowing the meaning. And if you don't, tell them who will. Um, so <coughs> kids, even um, younger, don't know. They'll come home and they'll say like, oh, 69, ho, 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 somebody was talking <laughs> about, you know, and they don't, and you think, oh my God, and what, what's going on with my kid? But oftentimes they don't really know. Um, Kendra and I have talked about this because for me, uh, I, I guess I have kind of a controversial approach. I've taken the energy out of bad words. <laughs> I've told my son, you want to say him? Say him. Say them at home, you know, if you say them at school, you're going to get into trouble. Um, and, you know, they're meaning, of course, he can't say F you to me or to anyone else. It's not about directing it, but if it's a oh shit or something like that, mm -hmm. taking the energy out. So there's one word, though, that I have put off the table. Can anyone guess what it is? <laughs> okay, that's very close. Same yes. bubble, yeah. <laughs> yes, but very close, but not. Uh, it's actually a word we hear even on TV. It's it's very, quote, benign compared to other words. Bitch. Bitch, Bitch. right, yeah. right. And a word that, you know, is everywhere and that kids say, adults say very easily. And the reason is because it's very, it's demeaning towards women. There's no counterpart for men with that word. Um, and it is always directed to women. So he's like, Oh, well, um, the boys call each other that too. Yes, mm -hmm. they do, they do, but like but yeah. what because what's the insult. reference? The, ref always an insult. the reference right. is you're acting exactly. like a girl. Yeah. Right? It goes mm -hmm. right back to mm -hmm. that. That is demeaning and lessening. So it's like, oh mom, everyone and I said so what I say in joining is, you know what? Call them a fucker. <laughs> Call them a fucker, but don't say that word. At least that's, you know, there's no, it's not gender related. So then he goes to school and he says to his friends, mm -hmm. boys and girls, like, you know what? My mom's so funny. She'll say, I should say fucker instead of bitch. <laughs> and then uh. he came back and said, one of the girls said, all right, for your mom, not only is she like, you know, lets you do that, but she's a feminist too. <laughs> and so I feel like it's such an important, you know, and it goes with family values too. What are, how do we join with our kids to share the message we want to share in a way that they can hear it? Mm -hmm. If I just told my son, don't say bitch, he would just be shut down and say it anyway. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's, <coughs> that's just something, yeah. you know, another way of being out of the box. Go ahead. I have teen, teenage sons, so I, we, I had these kind of conversations too. 
And I think that the sort of thing that, that binds all of it is, you can say whatever words you want to say, but I'm going to let you know if that affects me, if that offends me. Mm -hmm. That's and awesome. you use that word, it hurts me because I feel, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, another way to join. Um, and what Daniela was talking about, again, it's not about never teaching lessons or values or having standards for what's okay, but you can't get there if, there's a, if they feel shut down. So join and then have that conversation. All right. So it is, we, we kind of talked about this when we broke up into groups, being aware of your own issues of shame when it comes to sexuality. What messages are you unknowingly sending to your kids? So this one, what comes up for me is really interesting. Um, next week, Kendra and I are out of school speaking to a very large parent organization. And so we've been going back and forth with the PTA. So they wanted it to be a little more PG rated than what we're doing today, or at least what I'm doing today. And so um, they made posters, and basically it was uh, Body, body image and sexuality um, and our kids. And so they called and they said, well, these posters are going around school. How do you think that's going to be for the kids when they see the word sexuality and kind of laughing? And so Kendra and I looked at each other like, well, isn't that the point? That words that we begin, that there's already this shame at the school. There's nothing inherently wrong at all with the word sexuality. And isn't that the point, that they do see it, and that we begin to have those conversations and all power to those kids who see the poster and say, hey, what's that about? So, um, you know, even when you had asked that question about schools, even when they want to do it, even when they're, here comes this underlying discomfort mm -hmm. that's right there. Yeah, and number nine, having conversations when you are calm and they are with you. Again, this applies to everyone, but physiology is so important because um, you, you become less triggered. There was a mom I was working with. She really wanted to join with her daughter and talk about what um, her daughter was going through. Daughter was in middle school, and she kept having these conversations in the car um, after school, on the way to gymnastics, when both were stressed, both were low blood sugar, and of course, both were so triggered. So the conversations went nowhere. So I worked with her, and she switched it to the weekends, trying to have these conversations, and it was a game changer. Both were opened up. Um, it's so, so important. And I'm trained in DIR floor time, and generally that's used for younger kids. Uh, but they're, they emphasize how important regulation is for the parent and regulation for the child. Because in order for the child to learn how to self-regulate, they need their parent to co-regulate. So again, applies to adults, but especially kids, it's so important. And so these conversations, um, kids really need their parents to be, you know, low stress and as present as possible. Obviously, it's not perfect, but presence over perfection is really what's important. Um, just adding to that, there's a lot of research too, and particularly in talking, and parents talk or anyone talks to boys, that it's not a sit down, let's sit down and talk, and that it's eye to eye, that it really is oftentimes while they're walking or maybe playing a board game or tossing a ball, where it makes it much easier than this direct, serious, let's have a conversation, where it is eye to eye. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to keep in mind too. Um, last, and we'll stop after this. Your kids are watching your dynamics, including the way you speak, touch, or look at your spouse partner, mm -hmm. the way your spouse looks and speaks about women, and the way you talk about your own body. Um, what are you unknowingly teaching <coughs> in regard to body image, objectification, and respect? And so um, two things that come up. One, you know, if, you know, mom says, oh my God, I feel so fat, or my butt looks so big, what do you, and kids hear that. What are those messages? And as Kendra always says, fat is not a feeling. Um, so <laughs> really important. 
Uh, the other thing is of uh, just the subtleties of family at the beach and dad's like reading the magazine but it's upside down because he's checking out the bodies, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you think kids don't see that, they see that. Mm -hmm. They see how, uh, you know, and especially we talked about the word, the B word or saying, you know, if dad's saying that to mom at home, what kind of message is that? So those, those really, really back to that modeling if you're seeing a couple um, and you know there's so many damaging words that they're saying to one another or objectification or it's derogatory, what is the impact? You know, always check in, they're coming for couples, but what's the impact for the kids and the family? Really important stuff. Um, the point of these two is just that we as parents have greater influence and they can move from little influence all the way to the other and, but um, we wanted to open it up for any questions, thoughts, comments. Mm -hmm. My question comes to just like the parental roles when there, I guess, when there is two parents, like is it inappropriate or more appropriate to have like mom, you know, mom speaking to the daughter versus the dad speaking to the boys? I just went into situations where people seemingly have healthy mm -hmm. environments going, but the moms like would never have the conversation with their boys about masturbation or anything like that. Is there like a recommended like, best practice? I, I think question. in general, it's a great question. It's really about the parent mm -hmm. who is most comfortable speaking. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and in yeah. every family, they know who that is. And usually <laughs> one parent is acquiescing and saying, no, 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 like you're going to be more comfortable <laughs> than I am. Yeah, especially one this person is, is taking responsibility to educate themselves and to learn like appropriate yeah. ways of language and facts. Yeah. Not their history necessarily. So. Yeah, okay. and addressing their own shame again takes that energy out of it. Yeah, yes. go ahead. Do you have resources to help parents like have these first conversations or general conversations, like set good context and like what language to use and mm -hmm. things like that, just kind of to guide them through and maybe really some of the anxiety around yeah. those conversations? Yeah, even some of these tips help, but there are a lot of different um, online resources that parents can use. There's one, Culture Reframed is very good. Um, there's, there are a bunch of go-to um, things, just even if people look it up. And yeah. just real quick, I think we often um, times tell parents the sex talk is this big like moment and this big thing that people plan for, but our <coughs> message is you can weave in little conversations here and there. Start small. You don't have to have this sit down. That gives everyone anxiety. So even just starting with social media and then as helping parents feel more and more comfortable about talking about it. But yeah, culture reframed is a good one. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm working with a family and it's like a really, really messy divorce situation and like both kid is 12, 11, 12, and is very disconnected from both parents, and me working with parents, like, I'm aware that it would cause way more harm than good if parents try to, like, enter into that world with him, and he's, yeah. he's compulsively watching porn. Is there clinically, like, any way that I should be, like, should I be that person for him? Should it just be focused on parent coaching, like, to the best of the ability, mm -hmm. even though it might do more harm than good, like how can I, I save that situation? <laughs> I would say as a clinician, use your gut. And if you're already saying yeah. it would be more harmful for them to go there, mm -hmm. then that's what you know. Okay. And maybe it's at best bringing up to the parents of, I think Sam really needs to have his own person to talk to. Um, if you're doing, if you can be that person, and I don't know exactly the logistics or dynamics if it's appropriate, great. Um, but I think it is recognizing that the parents just, especially at this point, aren't equipped to do that, mm -hmm. and to really give that child some something he needs. Um, but that is, that's a rough situation because mm -hmm. it's not going to good places. And he's young. Yeah. 